Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day five of our series, Greening Our Cities. I am pumped up. Today, we're going to delve into a crucial topic, waste reduction, sustainable production, creating a circular economy. I am thrilled to have a panel of esteemed experts joining us today, bringing their unique perspectives and experience to the table. It's been a fantastic week and we're just gonna keep it rolling. In an era where environmental concerns are more pressing than ever, it is essential that we redefine our approach to waste and production. The linear model where resources are extracted, transformed into products and eventually discarded is just no longer viable. Instead, we have to embrace a circular economy, a system that promotes recycling, reuse, and regeneration. It's a paradigm shift, and it holds the promise of minimizing waste, conserving resources, and nurturing a harmonious relationship between humans and the environment. So we have three amazing guests. Our first panelist is Fiona Ma, California's 34th state treasurer. We also have Rachel Oster, the co-owner of Diversion Strategies. And finally, we are honored to have Terrell Hagler with us, who's the founder and president of the renowned Your Favorite Trash Men brand. So I'm going <laughs> to toss it over to Carla and let her read everyone's bio so that we know exactly who you are and what you've accomplished. And we're going to get going. So go ahead, Carla, take it away. Fiona Ma is California's 34th state treasurer. She was, the, she was first elected on November 6, 2018, with a record-breaking number of votes, 7,825,587, the highest ever by a treasurer candidate in the state's history. Treasurer Ma achieved re-election on November 8, 2022. Notably, she is the first woman of color and the first woman certified public accountant to be elected to this position. The, the state treasurer's office established in California's constitution in 1849 plays a vital role in financing crucial infrastructure projects that benefit the lives of residents, such as schools, roads. Treasurer Moss serves as a state's primary banker. Her office currently processes over $3 trillion in banking transactions. She ensures transparency and oversight of the government's investment portfolio, accounts, and surplus funds. Furthermore, Treasurer Ma oversees an investment portfolio averaging over 200 billion, a significant portion of which beneficially, beneficially owned by more than 2,200 2, local governments in California. She also acts as the agent of sale for state bonds and is the trustee of billions of dollars of state indebtedness. Welcome, Treasurer Ma. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to see everyone. And I'm so happy I am on this panel with the fabulous Rachel Oster, uh, as well as uh, your fave. He is my fave, uh, Terrell. And so I look forward to uh, this panel. Um, as the state treasurer, I am the banker. So all of the revenues come into my office. I also chair 14 boards, commissions, and authorities that funds affordable housing, charter schools, hospitals, children's hospitals, advanced manufacturing, green energy, uh, and all of the different programs. And so garbage and recycling uh, started out when I was, um, my interest started out when I was on the Board of Supervisors 20 years ago, when they said that our landfills were going to fill up. Uh, by 2014. And I said, well, what are we going to do with our garbage after that? And they said, well, that's the problem. And so that started me down this uh, path of how do we keep items out of the uh, out of the landfill? You know, like we were talking yesterday, because yesterday was World Oceans Day. And I was I'm down here in Oxnard talking at the Port of Wainimi. And we were talking about garbage and recycling, how like Florida, they don't even dig down. They just pile it up and then cover it with, uh, you know, with, um, you know, with, with dirt and the pilots in Florida fly based on these mounds of garbage that they see. I mean, that is really scary and we have to do better, especially post pandemic where everyone is ordering online right now and you get boxes and boxes and, you know, all the stuffing that goes, uh, goes with it. And if we don't do better as a society, if, if we're not consciously thinking about employing new technologies to 
deal with our waste, then we are going to forever have this problem and it's going to continue to get worse. So I'm working with, you know, Rachel uh, and others in trying to bring the tech sector um, more get the tech sector more actively involved and change some of the status quo mindsets, right? Because a lot of the rules and the laws that have been written are based on what, 30, 40 years of, of you know, garbage mentality. And these days we're able to, you know, recycle, upcycle, uh, get rid of, um, keep out of the landfill much, much better. And Rachel is obviously more of an expert than I am. In my office, we do fund a lot of green energy um, uh, projects, either through a sales tax exemption program. It is a competitive program, but if you are cleaning and greening and buying big expensive equipment, you can apply to waive your sales and use taxes. And that could be anywhere from seven and a half to 12% uh, in certain jurisdictions. So that is one way we are uh, encouraging uh, the new technologies, um, as well as a Cal Competes program where you can apply to defer your income taxes three to five years. But it really has to be for those companies that have other options that, but for this Cal Competes, they're going to leave or they're going to move some of their operations to another state. Uh, so that is our other tool. And then we have all sorts of partnerships. We've been working with CARB, for example, on uh, retrofitting or um, helping uh, truck owners convert from to convert to cleaner uh, vehicles, whether it's zero emissions or hydrogen or you know other um, natural gas. Um, so that is a program that we have been expanding. The governor's really, um, you know, supporting that because he set a goal of zero emission vehicles by 2035 and then another goal for zero emission trucks. And so California has been at the forefront of cleaning and greening um, and combating climate change, but we need more help. We need more advocates like all of you who are on this phone to get involved, to reach out to your assembly members and your, your senators, show up in committee when there are good bills because there's a lot of forces that continue, uh, that want it to stay the same way, right? Slow, dirty, you know, um, uh, not efficient because they've been making money, you know, this whole time through the same system. And so when you, um, disrupt the system and, and all of a sudden, you know, you're making things more efficient and cheaper and easier. Uh, some people are not going to have the same jobs and not have that, that industry share. So this is what we're all about is uh, trying to bring new ideas and try to woo them to California so that we can deal with our garbage. We are the fourth largest economy. We have 40 million people. Post COVID, everybody is still ordering all the time off the internet, yes. right? bottled waters. We thought we were going to, you know, get a hold on, you know, the, the plastic bottles, uh, water containers. And then now COVID happened and everyone has to go back to plastic bottles again. And so how do we make sure that um, we're doing our best to uh, make sure we're recycling and uh, the manufacturers are producing uh, items that are recyclable versus um, those that have to be thrown in the, in the landfill, for example. But I'm going to turn it over to my uh, fellow panelists and look forward to the, the discussion today. Thank you so much, Treasurer Ma. Um, that was some awesome information. I I was listening to all of the initiatives that you're working on. And one of the things that um, came up for me was our discussion yesterday. Rachel was part of that discussion when we were talking about extended uh, producer responsibility. And you brought up um, the water bottles. And I was just having this conversation with someone um, yesterday about the Brita filter, because, you know, I switched over a while ago to Brita filter so that I don't have um, water bottles in the house, but the filter is not easily recyclable, right? You have to go through so many, you know, changes just to recycle that filter. So, you know, we have to start thinking about that too, when we're, you know, trying to make things more sustainable and we're trying to make things easier to recycle and we want people to change their behaviors. It has to be easy for them to do. Otherwise they won't do it. Right. So, you know, I'm I, I'm really happy that we're having this discussion. We're gonna um, move to, I believe Rachel is next. Um, Carla, you wanna introduce Rachel Oster to our wonderful audience. 
All righty. Welcome, Rachel Oster. She's the owner, co-owner of Diversion Strategies, a consulting firm focused on supporting innovators in the industry and is also the co-founder of Women in Solid Waste and Recycling, Wiser, an organization with a vision to diversify the leadership of the waste and recycling industry by giving women the tools and support they need to be successful leaders. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you so much. So excited to be here with two of my favorite people um, as, as panelists and, uh, and facilitated by the wonderful Anika. The universe brought us together for a reason. And I'm just so excited to see, you know, continue to see it pop up and um, and add value to what you're doing and you adding value to what we're doing. It's just um, a function of my favorite thing, which is collaboration and, and making good connections. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Rachel was here yesterday, so we did, we kind of went in depth yesterday, but I have new questions for you, Rachel, so don't worry about it. We're not going to ask you the same questions as we did yesterday. Um, next, we have the wonderful uh, Terrell Hagler. Your fave trash man. He's the first uh, social media influencer for social media influencer for waste and recycling. So I would love for uh, Carla to introduce us to Terrell. All righty, Mr. Hagler. Terrell Hagler is the founder and president of Your Fave Trash Man brand. He is nominated. He is nominated for an honorary doctor of philosophy in business administration at TIUA School of Business. Terrell is the father of three children, Aria, Aiden, and Aubrey. He is an author, business coach, and verified social media influencer with over 31,700 followers. Terrell founded Your Fave Hauling Service, a company supplementing the city's sanitation department and combating illegal dumping. He is also the founder and president of Trash to Treasure, a nonprofit organization dedicated to environmental justice. Terrell has organized 84 cleanup events, mobilized 5,608 volunteers, obtained sponsorship from 32 businesses and removed 415 tons of trash in the past two years. He has received recognition and awards from waste management, from the waste management industry as a rising leader and change maker, as well as being named one of the 40 under 40 people in the waste industry to know. Terrell's influence extends beyond Philadelphia as he has been a keynote speaker for environmental organizations nationwide, invited to the White House by President Biden and featured as various t on various TV shows, including the Kelly Clarkson Show, Good Morning America, and the Today Show. He has been honored with congressional citations for community service, citations from the City of Philadelphia City Council, the Neighborhood Hero Award, and, the, and a State House Citation. Terrell has been voted Most Valuable Philadelphian, Best Local Hero, and Best Activist by Billy Penn Media and Philadelphia Magazine, and recognized as a generational change leader by Philadelphia Citizen Magazine. And he is currently working on expanding his impact in Philadelphia by hosting community cleanups and resource days throughout the city with the goal of making Philadelphia the greatest city in the world. Welcome, Mr. Hagler. Hi, guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks welcome, for Welcome, welcome. How Thank are you? I am, I'm, I'm good. I'm, um, we're, uh, us on the East Coast are dealing with this Canada wildfire, so yeah. Um, uh, that's gonna would, be crazy yeah it, it for the last three days it just smelled like there was a burning house on your lawn um oh but goodness. i'm here i'm excited to have this conversation with two of my favorite people <laughs> treasure of mine and rachel um it was great meeting you at waste expo and just yes. seeing the synergy come together and uh, it's just good to know that i'm not the only one that just wants a clean world so i feel humbled in the fact that I have people in my circle that want the same thing as me. I love it. Thank you so much, Terrell. We're excited to have this conversation. 
Lanika E. Johnson is a distinguished entrepreneur and waste management expert with a proven track record in the industry. As the founder and managing partner of Trash Logic LLC, she has leveraged her expertise and experience to build a groundbreaking waste management service that optimizes waste diversion and delivers significant cost savings to clients. Lanika's journey to this point has been characterized by a strong focus on strategy and expansion with a deep commitment to sustainability and innovation. Welcome, everybody. This is Lanika Johnson. Good morning. All right. Let's go. Let's go. You guys ready? All right. Yeah. My first question is for Treasurer Ma. So as California State Treasurer, you oversee financing for various infrastructure projects. How do you prioritize investments in recycling and waste management initiatives to promote sustainability? Yeah, so like I said, I've got a whole bunch of different um, committees and one um, issues tax exempt private activity bonds. Uh, and so a lot of the companies that are in this space uh, need access to capital. And so what they will do is they'll apply to my office and then we allocate them a certain amount of bond cap and then they can go to the market to uh, seek private investors to help them expand. Uh, that is a competitive pool because that same private activity bonds is also used for affordable housing. And so every year I have to kind of fight for an allocation because I say you can't build affordable housing without wastewater, garbage, right. recycling all the things that we are trying to do. But because housing is such a crisis here in California, it is a big fight. Again, you know, whenever you're fighting for resources, everybody gets really, um, you know, the, the, the claws come out basically and say, this is my right. portion. This is my portion. Uh, so that's what I've been doing because I do believe garbage and recycling is important and they can't get to the next level without a large infusion of capital to buy that next robot or, you know, expand their facility or buy that, you know, garbage truck. I mean, these garbage trucks are costing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like I couldn't believe like even a clean uh, truck that we saw at Waste S Expo was like, what, half a million dollars or something. So how are these companies going to, um, uh, afford it. So it is a competitive system here in California. And so we try to fund, you know, the best and the brightest, the ones that are going to do and have the most impact, uh, move the needle uh, as best as possible. And I do a lot of tours personally where I go out and visit so I can see for myself, you know, are they really ready to go to that next level where I'm going to go and advocate uh, so that they can get funding, resources, grants, loans, um, you know, able to sell bonds. So that's what I do out of my office since I've been around a long time. You know, I've been doing this for 20 years. I kind of know where the money is. Uh, like kind of you open up the hood, you know where everything uh, is or should be. And so garbage and recycling, as I said, has been a big priority and I keep pushing, pushing, pushing. And I participate and we travel to other states and other countries to see what the best practices are and then try to bring it back pass it through legislation or change regulations so that we can accommodate uh, and stay competitive. That's that's really um, a good point that you made about how California has this housing crisis. And so that kind of affects everything, right? It affects so many things that we, that we do and um, how we prioritize things and how we think about things. Um, it, a lot of times it does come back to housing. I wanted to um, go over to Terrell real quick because he's in Philadelphia. He's not in California. So I'm in California. Um, Treasurer Ma is in California. Rachel, where are you? I know you work in California, but where are you? I live in um, Connecticut. You live in Connecticut. Okay. So Terrell is in uh, Philadelphia. So Terrell, um, explain to us kind of what the landscape in Philadelphia is around waste and recycling. Um, how do people feel about recycling? Um, how does your how's your state handle recycling? How does that look there in Philadelphia? Um, honestly, we are really behind. We are we are extremely behind. We are one of the only big cities that still manually throws trash, which means people are allowed to put to bag their trash can trash up and just put the bag on the curb. And sanitation workers have to come grab it, throw it in the truck. We don't have the arms or anything like that. Um, and 2020, Philadelphia was voted the dirtiest city in America by Forbes oh, magazine. Wow. 
Um, wow. so that's kind of where I got the, the, the energy to really ignite a movement when it comes to sustainability here in the city. And, um, but I have hope. We, uh, we just had uh, our, uh, our primary for our uh, Democratic uh, mayoral candidate. And so we have our general in November and every conversation has been about a greener Philadelphia, a more sustainable Philadelphia. Um, uh, we have a Senator named Bob Casey, who's very climate conscious. Um, so I I have faith and that's why I, I drum the way I drum and I, I yell from the mountaintops the way I do about keeping the city clean, about changing perspectives. And, you know, my saying here is no matter your zip code, you deserve to live on a clean street. You know, yes. we, have, we have a history of certain areas in our city have been intentionally disinvested in. And now we're seeing the repercussions of that disinvestment 70 years later, you know. Crime is at an all-time high. You know, over the last two years, we've had a thousand murders. So that's five hundred and uh, over a thousand. Five hundred and twenty murders were averaging for the last two years, and it's all coming from the disinvestment, the blight, the illegal dumping, the trash, the crime. And studies show, and in Philadelphia, when you clean and green a space, you reduce crime up to thirty percent. Right. So. Wow. And Philly is, is in a transitional phase to, to answer your question, but I have hope. Uh, I've spoken to potentially both candidates who will ever be the new mayor and uh, a greener Philadelphia is definitely top three on the list. That's exciting. I'm really glad that you're working in this space. We're we're really excited for um, to see what you're doing, um, not only just in the city of Philadelphia, but how you're educating the public and how you're educating students. Um, it's really exciting to see. So, Rachel, we're gonna we're gonna pivot over to you for just a second. So, Rachel, as the co-founder of Wiser, we talked about this yesterday. How has um, empowering women in the industry contributed to changing the industry? How do you see women coming in and just really changing the waste and recycling industry? Yeah, um, oh, in so many ways, it's hard to choose just one. But what immediately comes up for me is that, um, you know, women actually hold most of the purchasing power for their household. So there's a statistic that like 80 percent of the purchasing in a household is done by uh, the woman in the household. Yes. And um, I think that that com that um, uh, that purchasing power has been really important because not only are women deciding what to purchase, they're deciding what to do with it as well in the household when um, it no longer has a usable life. So um, and women are really ingenious around um, making sure they get the most value out of things. And I think that's really what we're talking about with the transition um, to the circular economy and uh, making things efficient because we're juggling everything. So um, I think when you have women at the top and leading the transition in this industry to the circular economy, you have that um, that perspective of, of, oh, these are the products that I'm purchasing, the and this is what I'm doing with them in the household, and connecting those dots. And, um, you know, because more and more, this industry has to be focused on what is happening at the curb. It's not just about rolling out the cart to the curb anymore and letting it go. It's about really um, engaging with the service and understanding what to do with your items that no longer have a usable life to you. And so um, getting that integrated into the industry and thinking about that um, is critically important to moving the needle for this industry into the circular economy. And so women bringing that thought process to the table is a really helpful way to move that needle. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, I think studies have shown that women in particular, we just we have we just have a different skill set. Obviously, you know, men have some of the same skill sets too. It's not that, you know, men can't have some of these soft skills and some of these skill sets, but I think that we generally have soft skills that we bring to the conversation that sometimes men don't necessarily think about. 
right? There's certain things that we think about when we're making purchasing decisions that men don't think about. Um, there's there's certain conversations that we'll have even in the boardroom that um, takes into you know takes into consideration the whole of the thing, right? The entire mm -hmm. the entire person, the entire the entire organization, you know how people feel, right? Yeah. I have All a I have things. a great example. I would just like ha I have to share this because it just okay. it's, it was my aha moment. I was standing in a San Francisco material recovery facility, and we were talking about, uh, and it was with a bunch of of men uh, from the sanitation worker who drove the truck to the management team to all the way to the city people that were trying to create the program, and we were talking about how do we divert more material. And they started talking about, well, we can put composting bins in bathrooms because it's mostly just paper towel. It's just paper towel in bathrooms. And um, the paper towel can be composted. It's paper-based, it's fiber-based. Okay, yeah, this is great. And I was like, uh, how about sanitary products for women? That's also in bathrooms and that's actually not a good compost feedstock. So it was just like this, it needed, a woman needed to be there to say that um, because that's our lived experience that just no. men can't understand or bring into the conversation. So, so <laughs> I always so like I have a story yeah, too. Yeah. So, so I, so I live with my father. My mom passed away five years ago and my dad, God bless him. He like has a compost and then we have, you know, two bins and then we have a general garbage. So I was on one of these tours and, you know, they were saying plastic bags cannot, not, not be, um, you know, not be recycled yet. My dad was lining our compost in a plastic bag. Cause he's like, well, it drips out. Right. And I was like, yeah, but now you put the plastic bag in the compost and now it is, you know, is, is infected. So mm -hmm. I had to go out and buy compostable bags and make mm -hmm. sure that he uses the compostable bags to line our compost so that we can actually, you know, uh, recycle it. So, you know, these are the little things that I think women yeah. think about in a household, whereas men, you know, do they really go do the shopping? No. But the women are the ones that are doing the shopping. And if we could educate them and change their mindset and go, listen, if you care about this, we need to change, you know, what we buy or what we recycle, what we reuse. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to leave you out of the conversation, Terrell. Do you, wanna, <laughs> do you have a, a story, too, that you want to share? Terrell's got lots. Uh, you know, I, I surround myself with a lot of women in business because uh, it's so true you guys don't you guys don't miss a beat you guys you guys mm -hmm. see and, and like I'm also that type of man that like I get something I push go I go right at it I'm going hard and then I have like a friend who I call we call each other like think partners so like mm -hmm. once a month we come together and we just bounce ideas off each other's and we like dissect each other's ideas and I'm like well you missed that and you and so mm -hmm. I recently had an opportunity for a huge contract and I was undervaluing myself but I was just so excited that this this person reached out to me and so I just mm -hmm. said yes and I was like about to sign the contract and she was like mm, but wouldn't it make more sense to do this that there today the, and I was mm -hmm. like I'll be right back <laughs> and then <laughs> and I was able to renegotiate the contract and get my value but if she wouldn't have stopped me it was just like do you don't you want to do the long game and not the short game? So I, I I totally agree. You we you guys are needed in this industry wholeheartedly. Yeah, I have um. So my little my story is um you know a little bit related. So I um I had a a large, I don't know Matt. Maybe you can tell me how many acres this property was. I I had a large project in um D.C. and I want to say it was a thirty acre project. Um, and I had to, um, I had to write a waste plan for this entire community and, you know, we're competing against these other companies, but the difference between my proposal and their proposal was that I sat on site for a full week and I literally watched the residents go to the trash bin and I saw what they threw away and I saw how often they went and what kinds of things they were throwing away and how they were using the trash areas and who was coming in and out of there and were there were they residents or were they people from outside coming in i literally watched for a week and that was the difference between me winning the contract 
you know, over someone else. And I think that as women, we just approach things from a different perspective. And I think that that, um, that really does play to our strengths, right? Whereas sometimes we won't get, we may not get the first consideration just because people don't automatically think women in waste, right? But we, once we get in there, we really are able to show our value. And I love that. Um, so back to Treasurer Ma, um, how do you envision the role of public-private partnerships in driving innovation and advance and advancements in waste reduction and sustainable production in California. Yeah, so I think the most uh, efficient and fastest way is to have these public-private partnerships. Um, anything you do here in California requires permitting, for example, sometimes CEQA review. And that is the number one complaint that we hear is that it takes so long to do any project in California. So if there is a way for uh, government officials to be out there, educated, understand you know, what the best practices are, then we can adjust internally our rules, our regulations, our competition, the way we uh, score and give points to these companies. But again, unless we understand how things work, then it's going to continue to be, well, it's always been like that. That's how it was, you know, for the last 20 years. But that's not an excuse anymore mm -hmm. if we're going to move faster forward uh, to this circular economy. So I just think that as someone who has the resources, the more I am educated, the more I can be an advocate for the industry. And again, that takes these partnerships. And that's why I'm so thankful uh, to Rachel and Terrell, you know, for always including me and bringing me along and introducing me to more people. Um, but I also want to talk about, maybe we can talk about our little TikTok challenge that we plan to have <laughs> to get the next generation. Because, right, we, okay. you know, the next generation is the people that come to me at Calsters and they say, hey, you're not going to be here when we have grandkids. Like, you have a responsibility. I want to divest from fossil fuels. These are the bad companies. And I'm like, you know, you're right. I'm not going to be here. So what is you know, what can we, uh, if we can educate our young people to be those ambassadors so that they can be, you know, those role models and send those messages to others, like don't, don't throw your garbage out of the car, right? Don't flick your cigarettes. I mean, we should know by now with all the wildfires, but people still flick mm -hmm. cigarettes out of the car. So what is the next generation going to do to ensure that they're going to have a cleaner uh, um, environment? I love it. Um, just to follow up on that question. So I know that you're you're working and I've, you know, I've met you. I think this is the third time that I've met you. And every time I've met you, it has been in these environments with, you know, people like Rachel and people like Terrell. Um, so I know that you are being very intentional about creating these partnerships and these relationships. Um, my question to you is because I find that um a lot of a lot of us in the private sector don't necessarily know how to navigate, you know, partnerships with the public sector. So what would you say is the best way for um, private citizens and private businesses that actually have something to lend to um, the sustainability conversation or just in creating change in the state to engage with not just your office, but with public officials? What's the best way to go about that? Well, I think uh, obviously participating in forums like this, inviting elected officials. Um, so yesterday I gave the keynote at the World Oceans Day talking about, mm -hmm. right, other, you know, what's under mm -hmm. well, the, the <laughs> alternate world that we have that we need to also mm -hmm. protect. But then I sat and listened to the panel after and there were three amazing panelists. And I said, I want to go visit all three of their companies. You know, one is uh, trying to deal with the purple urchin population, mm -hmm. um, how the purple urchin is invasive and they eat the kelp and it's it's ruining the whole ecosystem. And I didn't even know that. And I went to go visit his company right after uh, to see wow. how he actually does that. And now, you know, if you follow me on Twitter or social media, I am trying to educate uh, the public about what these companies are doing. Another one has all natural pesticides and fertilizers. So he takes nutrients from the ocean and then he converts it. And then you can use it now in your home, at your school site, on your um, farm. 
so that we don't have those toxic runoffs running into our, our, our water stream, killing our fish, killing our, you know, fish and, and kelp in the, in the ocean because of all these toxic toxins that are going uh, into our waterways. And like, I didn't really think about that. And so, you know, I'm going to go check him out. And then another woman uh, can't get the permits in California, but she is, has like a waste to energy using heat uh, to, um, you know, to, 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 to get rid of the garbage and she's going to be doing it in Florida, her first site, mm. because she just can't get it permanent here. So next time I go to Florida, I will go and visit her. But that's how I learned about what other people are doing and, and what, um, you know, by inviting us to panels and listening to these experts, I think is really, really helpful. I, got I love something. it. Go ahead. <laughs> Never approach the actual official. Okay. They go for their chief of staff and their scheduler because they really don't, the, the actual official don't control nothing. You get to their <laughs> chief of staff, you get Except to me. Except me, Terrell. I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, that's not I true because uh, you guys call. Okay, I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak about Philadelphia. <laughs> All of my success has been not even worrying about the official, getting to the chief of staff, getting to the scheduler, getting on yeah. the schedule, and then the conversation goes from there. Yeah. And I, you know, I agree with you because not all officials are as um, personable or as approachable, right, as Treasurer Ma. She actually accepted my invitation in person, you know, person to person. So I appreciate that. Um, but I, I do agree. I was in D.C. for a lobby day. Um, I'm on a I'm on a board for another organization. So I was in D.C. for a lobby day. And yeah, we met with there. We met with all of the legislators teams and not necessarily with, you know, the legislators. So I, you know, to your point, you know, that that is, you know, somewhat true. So um, I have a question for the whole group. So anybody can can answer this question. So in your respective areas of expertise, what are some key barriers or challenges that hinder progress towards a circular economy and how can we overcome it? Anybody can jump in here. I would like to jump in on that. So okay. I, I I heard Treasurer Ma talking before about how do we integrate innovation? How do we make it easier for these innovative programs, technologies to integrate themselves into an already very um, long held way of thinking, but also, you know, legally <laughs> um, way of doing things. And I think one of the things that we need to focus on and and reform is solid waste contracting because without fail, I think these innovative technologies where I see them start to face challenges is, is procuring feedstock. And that's because um, many solid waste contracts are managed and governed through contracts or the, the solid waste management flow are governed by contracts that are um, very uh, an old way of doing things. And so it doesn't, it, it provides a lot of exclusivity to one um, organization and doesn't allow for innovation in other areas um, because of the exclusivity of just the flow of that material. And so one thing that we have to look at is how do we reform contracts to be more inclusive um, of uh, different types of programs and be more consumer facing. I think that's one of the areas that has really tripped up innovation is that these contracts are also governed by city councils and um, and and it, it ends up with the consumers kind of being blind to what services are available to them. They just have to, to um, use the service that uh, is, is given to them. Um, so I think that in order to make a lot of change, this industry has to be more consumer facing, which is why we're mm. working on programs like um, the TikTok challenge, because that gets the conversation uh, to, to the consumer in a way that it hasn't before. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think reform on the solid waste contracting is this like root issue that isn't sexy. <laughs> it's not <laughs> fun, but yeah. it is what governs the way our solid waste is managed 
um, in many areas of the country, specifically in California, but in many areas of the country um, and, and just stymies innovation. So um, I'm glad you brought that up because one of one of the things that I have been screaming from the mountaintops for years is that when these franchise agreements are um, are drafted and when these franchise agreements are being discussed, there there are no stakeholders at the table besides the city and the hauler. And you know, I always say bring in you know a consultant like us and just ask us to break down the, the agreement. That's it, just ask us to break it down. We will literally tell you what everything means, what the implications are, how that's gonna affect the community. Do that in the beginning so that, because what happens is you sign these 15, 20, 30 year franchise agreements, right? You're locked in as a city and once it's rolled out, now you have your residents up in arms because they weren't at the table. They didn't get a say. They don't know what these things mean. And now their rates are skyrocketing and there's no way for them to come at it now. You're locked in for 30 years. So before you do that, bring someone in to actually break it down and make sure that everyone, every single stakeholder is represented. And yeah. I've been saying that forever. And uh, that was yeah. one of yeah, that was why I was asking, you know, how do we, <laughs> how do we as, you know, private companies really engage with the public, um, with the public sector and, you know, get in front of these people that are making the decisions so that they understand, because I just think that there's just a lack of education around that, about what can be done and what's available, right? Yeah, So I, I, I recently from, heard a story. I love like examples because it just like brings it down to the earth. So like, I just recently heard a story where a company wanted to come in and provide a service where people could pay a minimal fee and they could have their reusables picked up or, you know, something that they didn't want to throw out, but that they thought could have another life outside of their home. So books, uh, appliances, just uh, different things. And um, so they started to try and offer the service. But then um, what happened was the incumbent was like, wait a second, um, that's that that we should be able to do that you can't you can't offer this reuse program because that's under the franchise agreement and actually very very distinctly in the franchise agreement it does say that if if a service is not offered in the current franchise it can be offered by another um provider but what the the city attorney came up with was like oh, but we do a bulk pickup day, a bulky item pickup day, and people can put their reusables in that. So that is covered under the franchise. And it's like, okay, so one, an access to one pickup a day where where people want to provide us, where people want to pay for a service where somebody can come and really give that those items another life where, you know, mm -hmm. it, so anyway, that's just an example of where we can, where those contracts really do stymie innovation. Um, and uh, yeah, that's just a real world example. Uh, Terrell, you want to, to weigh in? It's the same here. Like I know mm -hmm. for me personally, it's so hard to get the decision makers to understand. Well, I'm not gonna lie. Let me not say that. So I've had, and I think I've told Rachel this idea maybe two years ago. Uh, in urban cities, rural cities, cities where there's a lot of um, disinvestment, it's most is a lot. A lot of times, it's dirty. It's a lot of litter on the ground. So I came up with this illegal dump task force, where I said that, and here in Philadelphia, we should have a part of the sanitation department that's just dedicated to litter and illegal dumping. Like you get a hundred sanitation workers, twenty trucks. They get their own phone number. As soon as you see an illegal dump, you call them. They come out. They they can dig through it to see who, who gets the fines. Like, do all the thing. But right now, our turnaround time for illegal dumping is 90 days. With a, with a task force, we can get that down to 72 hours. So I've been beating that drum, beating that drum, beating that drum, saying it, saying it, proposing it, RFPs, all the things, nothing. I look at this year's city budget proposed by the mayor. There is a... Uh, a a, a, an addendum to the budget for $72 million for trash crews to just uh, to just do illegal dumping. And I'm like, okay, 
But two years ago, if we would have did this, we wouldn't even like it had been already rolling and half the city would be clean. So it's 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 kind of like same thing Rachel said is when when you know like there's this thing will work and the people who make the decisions don't get it and you like say it nine different ways and they still don't get it and then somehow some way someone else says it and they get it and it's like yeah I have a great idea and you're like mm, do you <laughs> right <laughs> okay. And, and, and right. I have to say that I have to say government also, right? Um, they want to always expand the number of people in government. And so to the extent that there's a good idea from the private sector, they want to take it and say, oh, we'll do it. But that takes a while to hire all these people, especially if you don't have experts. And sometimes government doesn't pay as much as the private sector. So I've had a hard time getting, you know, top notch yeah. experts to kind of run some of my programs because the pay is too low. But to answer your question, I think one of the hardest things, the impediments for elected officials is the lobbyists. And in California, we are a full-time legislature and we have lots of lobbyists. There's like 6,000 lobbyists that are employed. Ooh. And whenever a bill gets out yeah. of one committee, if it gets out, then the industry or the company hires another lobbyist to try to kill it in the next um, you know, the next committee and the next house. So that is the hardest part for elected officials who want to see change. But then you have these, you know, lobbyists and they all work together. And, and sometimes if they're not happy uh, with your bill, they're going to, you know, get more lobbyists. And then they put pressure on us and they put, you know, mail pieces in our district. They start putting TV ads, billboards against us. And so that's kind of the pressure from from us. If we don't get enough buy in or enough bipartisan support or sometimes these ideas take a while, like Terrell was saying, it took him, you know, two years of pounding the drum before someone said, OK, maybe that is a good idea. That's a, That's a really good point. I mean, you think about the pressure that elected officials are under, right, just from not just the public, right? But these lobbying groups and then, you know, their donors. And there's just so many different competing interests coming in. Um, and I think that's why the education is so important, right? We have to educate the public. If we don't educate the public, then they don't know what they're voting on and they don't know what they're, what they're for and what they're against. They're just going off of what people told them. So I think the education part is so important. So shifting to education, um, I know education is a big part of what I do. Can each of you speak to how education plays into what you do and what, what your platform is? So I'll yeah, go first. Go oh, ahead, Terrell. Well. No, ladies first. <laughs> ladies first, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I'm not, I am not as boots on the ground as Terrell in terms of educating. He's the person who's out there doing the actual educating. I think I beat the drum in a different way on education. And mm -hmm. that is that um, I am at, as an advocate of the industry and for innovation in the industry, I always talk about the supply chain that we're working with, because that's really what we have to um, embody as an industry is that we have to embody a manufacturer's mindset and understand that we are dealing with a supply chain of materials that will eventually be commoditized at the end. And I am always, always, always saying that the first step in the supply chain is education. Because yes. um, people think of about the collection or the curb being the first step is picking it up and taking it to the next stop. But really, it is the consciousness of the human at the at the bin doing the sorting. And we have to influence that. And that is done through education. And I think I stated yesterday, the state of California, um, when they rolled out their mandatory organics recycling, which is a huge consciousness shift, we have to get people to now start thinking about, okay, now we separate our food scraps as Treasurer Ma described with her dad, you know, even well-meaning, we can get start parts of it wrong. Um, and so the, the state invested $3 million. That's it. I mean, that is not enough for the fourth largest economy in the world to invest in a campaign to educate the public that this was coming. Um, and that's why, you know, we have to think about like the, you know, our TikTok, our Recycle Right TikTok challenge to get different kinds of education out there. We can't rely on a $3 million public information campaign. 
Um, so yeah, I think um, really on this industry embracing the fact that education is the first step in creating a really good quality supply of materials so we can get to the circular economy because contamination is what will stop it from happening. And the best place to stop contamination is with the human at the bin sorting it properly. And um, that takes a well-informed consumer and that consciousness shift that we're talking about and trying to achieve. Terrell? Yeah, so for me, I, I, I definitely am always uh, giving out tips, giving out hints. Um, and, and like she said in my introduction, I'm a dad of three. And I realized that by teaching my six-year-old how to compost, how to recycle, there was like a light bulb that went off in her that she went back to her school and was like, why don't we have blue bins in the classroom? To the point where the teacher was like, all right, now we're going to add a recycling program for this kindergarten class because Aubrey will not stop talking about a blue bin. Like, so like, kind of like the Canada wildfires, we got to set a wildfire in the children so that the next generation grows up climate conscious or grows up with that in mind. Like, so for me, I wrote a children's book teaching about recycling, about composting, about sanitation workers. And from that book, I was actually able to create a workshop. So now I have a whole one hour workshop called Before You Trash It. And it's all about teaching children the options they have before just throwing something away. And it's like, people are like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And like, what's more annoying than a six year old telling you, don't throw that in there, wash that out, clean. Like you'll just change your whole lifestyle because of the children driving the engine. So. For me, the like I have three three words that are like implement like they are staples in my in my company is educate, integrate, advocate in that order. We have to educate everybody, integrate all communities, all public sectors, all parts of the the city, and then everyone becomes an advocate for a cleaner city. So we that those are the those, that three educate, integrate, advocate. We have to keep those three all in order. I love it. Educate, integrate, advocate. Okay, Treasurer Ma. Okay, so because of all the work that we are doing with the young people, um, I am starting a Calif uh, San Francisco Farm Bureau. Uh, believe it or not, San Francisco is one of the only counties, like four counties in California that doesn't have a Farm Bureau. And what my priority is, is really the next generation. Uh, there is a great program called Ag in the Classroom, where uh, Farmers and ranchers go into a classroom and bring animals. They teach, you know, about, you know, food and and sustainability and composting and use and all that into the classrooms. But there's only like one school that does it. I want to have more schools that do it right. We need to set up scholarships and internships in the summer so that the kids understand like how important food is. But part of food is the whole circular economy too, right? You can grow it, then you, you know, you, you can feed people, but sometimes, you know, you can't sell it. And so what can you do with those fruits and vegetables that you can't sell, right? You can reuse it for animals, for, for all sorts of stuff. So for me, it's the young people that are gonna change habits. And here in California, there tends to be a fight, right? About water, like who should have water? Should it be the urbans or should it be the farmers? If we all care about food and food security post-COVID, I am doubling down that California needs to remain the agriculture center. We need to continue to produce food here in California because once you pave over uh, farmland, it is never going to come back. And that's the danger, right? So the young people, I think, are going to be the ones that are going to be like, yeah, we love fresh fruits and vegetables. Like, we didn't really know that. But now that we do, we need to protect it. So, again, going back to the young people, changing those hearts and minds, educating them early so that they can be an advocate for the things that we uh, all care about. I'm glad that you you brought up um, food because, obviously, you know, we're really, really focused on food waste here in California. I'm not sure how much um, so in Philadelphia, but here we're really focused on SB 1383. And I think more so, more than the organics in general, we're focused on food waste and what we're doing with that. Um, when I was at Waste Expo, there were quite a few 
Um, there were quite a few forums and conversations that I attended where um, there were different conversations about how to um, use food waste from restaurants and integrate that back into the community. So um, do any of you know of any programs that you can talk about? And then, you know what, one thing I don't want to forget, don't let me forget, is you guys have all mentioned your TikTok challenge. I want to get back to that. But <laughs> before we get to that, I want to hear from you guys. Have you heard of any programs um, that use leftover food or food waste in restaurants um, to feed, you know, communities, feed the hungry, feed, you know, to just reuse that food. So here in Philly, we actually are, uh, we were considered a food desert at one point. Like you could go almost, I think a thousand feet between houses and there was no fresh supermarket. So we, they started adding more supermarkets. I know for me, uh, with all of my cleanups that I do, I now add Grocery. So I have, there's a company in Philly called Sharing Access, started by these Drexel students, uh, my friend Evan. He drops off a thousand pounds of food. And so while some of us are doing the cleanup, another part of the volunteers are bagging groceries and then we're dropping them off on the doorsteps of the neighborhoods we're in. So like that's one company. Um, we have a, a company called Phil Abundance that they spend all year just collecting canned goods and then giving them to shelters. Um, there's fill abundance, there's share food. Like, so here in Philly, we are very food conscious. And I was actually just talking to Rachel about a new project I'm working on where this, this basketball center has like on and off court life skills and they're gonna have a commissary kitchen. So when I was touring and I was like, oh, you guys are building a new state-of-the-art kitchen. Like, so where are you gonna upcycle? And they were like, what, what is that? I was like, what, what do you mean? What is upcycling? How are you building a $35 million building and you don't know what up? So like, it goes back to that education and it, and it goes back to like, we have to, us on here, we have to continue to always be the advocate anywhere like it just you just never we just have to wear that i just figured i just i have to wear that shirt everywhere i go i just have to be that advocate um but yes to answer your question we have a few programs here and i'm am very food conscious uh when i do my events uh, i now have a dj and i give out like i have a friend who has a food truck and he'll just pull up and grill hot dogs and hamburgers and we'll have kids like oh i haven't eaten since yesterday and i'm like well you are eating now so that's all that matters I love that, Terrell, you um, integrating the food into your cleanups. It's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, in California, right, Rachel, it's illegal to reuse food. So once food is served, um, you cannot reuse it. However, there are companies that are taking the unsold uh, produce at grocery stores. For example, you know, sometimes when they're bruised or, you know, they lose their like luster, then they will take it and they will uh, reuse it and uh, produce, you know, like dog food, for example, uh, and, and other feed for animals. And then other ones are using that type of type of like meats for energy, but you kind of need a lot of it. And it's again, it's like a secondary, uh, you know, vendor, a, a middleman that has to go uh, to the grocery store and then, you know, either pick it up or have a location for them to drop off. And then they have to go convert it into, you know, energy or uh, another food stock. So that's about the closest thing I can, I can see to reusing fresh, you know, fruits and vegetables and nuts and meat. So you guys um, mentioned your TikTok challenge a couple of times. So I really want to hear about this TikTok challenge and I want to find out what that's all about. So if you can just kind of like fill, in, fill the audience in on what this TikTok challenge is, I'm, I'll be really excited to hear about it. Really exciting, actually, not this past race expo, but the previous one, um, Terrell's first race expo and also Treasure Ma's first race expo. Um, we were all standing chatting and we were talking about uh, really just what we've been talking about today. Like, how do we better educate people how do we um like raise the um uh like the kind of put in the spotlight this industry in a way that it hasn't before because we are shifting to a circular economy and what's it going to take and um and Terrell was like we need a challenge we need a social media challenge like we need a TikTok challenge <laughs> 
And, um, and I, Fiona like was like, yes, that's what we need. And she was like, I will support that. I will support it in any way that I can. I know you guys could probably come up with a great TikTok challenge and you just tell me what I need to do and I will be there. Um, I will be there to support it. And so over the next few months, we started to really, uh, and Terrell, you can jump in anytime, but we started to really kind of figure (laughs) figure out um, what would, what that challenge would look like. And what we came up with was that we could challenge the youth of starting in California, um, but eventually going nationwide, but we could, we could challenge the youth of California to come, come up with videos about how to recycle right. Um, because we, you know, we all know that contamination in the material stream is what can really hinder the commoditization of our materials, right. Um, at their, at the end of their useful life. And so, um, and so how do we recycle, right? There's so much confusion around that. People are like, oh, I heard only 9% of plastics are recycled. I don't even want to do it anymore. You know, mm. so um, so what we came up with is that the way to recycle right is to is to educate yourself on what happens locally. So think locally. And so um, we cha- we what we're going to do is challenge the youth of California to come up with videos that can either be like a dance, a song, um, a any sort of creative expression about how to recycle right and that the focus be recycle right by thinking locally and understanding what happens at the local level. And it's really cool because Mikey Pesciuto has that, um, that we saw yesterday, has that great app where people can scan a barcode on any product and it shows them what it can, what can be done with that product locally in terms of um, its recyclability. And so that's just like a great integration of what we're trying to achieve here. Um, And so with these um, challenge videos, uh, there would be a panel of judges who judge the videos and come up up with several winners in different categories and then um, that we would then grant the winners money to establish a recycling program at their school um, and uh, and and have that kind of be awarded um, in a very public way and um, and to then follow up on that program to make sure that it's doing what its intent was. And so um, we started immediately fundraising for this idea um, and because we knew we needed money to accomplish it. um, And we raised $30,000 right away. um, And then we found out that the US EPA was putting forth these um, education and outreach grants for projects just like this. So it's it was like we read the EPA's grant and we were like this is this is for our TikTok challenge. Like this is it. Um they were writing this for us. So we got together some really great partners. We have the National Stewardship Action Council Heidi Sanborn. If you haven't met her, she's a great person to connect with as well. Um the treasurer uh of California Fiona Ma, um Yefave um, and also our nonprofit, Women in Solid Waste and Recycling, all partnered on this um, grant proposal. And we're waiting to hear in the summer if we receive it. Um, but even if we don't, we still want to move ahead with it with with right. private partnership. And we have a really great idea about how to integrate brands. And so brands can get involved in supporting these like influencers and young people and mm-hmm. saying like, this is how you recycle my brand's product. And so we think there's a really good opportunity here to engage children and engage the brands um, and get that message out that we recycle right by really thinking about our own communities. And I think that drives a lot of change as well, because it just makes people kind of like, co- like not think so globally about recycling, but collapse in on their own communities and what is really doable within their own communities. And it's is like, there, is there an age spot. group? Um, we have two age groups. We have um, K through five and then six through um, 12. So yeah, two separate age groups. Um, and with the younger groups, we're going to ask them to submit as a classroom. So, um, and then the teachers would get the grants themselves. So 
Yeah, it's it's really uh, it's really an exciting project. It's um, definitely a labor of love to do it, and um, like I, it's 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 um, it's something I'm really excited about, and I can't wait. Like I I am I am like for sure we're getting this grant. So if we don't, everybody put your good juju out because we yes. really want to be successful with it. So that sounds really exciting. It sounds like something that you Terrell would do. Um, even if you weren't part of this, like this just sounds like something that your organization would be a part of because you're, you are the, you know, waste influencer. Well, I, that's where the idea came from. Cause my first waste expo, I was like blown away. And I was like, how do I do this across the country? And then meeting Rachel and then meeting Treasure Mine, I was just like, oh, there we go. And then, so my hope is that once it starts in California, Treasurer Mob will challenge the treasurer of Pennsylvania, and then the treasurer of Pennsylvania will challenge the treasurer of DC, and then the treasurer of DC will, and now we have local, you know, you have all the treasurers challenging each other for the state to get involved in the recycle right challenge. That's fantastic. That's so smart. <laughs> that's yeah. that's how you do it. And yeah. that's how you and, and national. That's and that's the partnership and the collaboration because you have yeah. social media influence, you have like solid waste and recycling expert, and then you have the political power of treasurer Ma, who's like, and I'll challenge my the my co treasurers, <laughs> and they can do yeah. it. <laughs> Their state, so I love it. It's fun. Yeah. I love it. I love it. So, um, getting back to some of these circular economy um, conversations. What do you think is the best way to educate the community on what the circular economy is and how they can contribute to it? For, for me, um, my way is uh, social media. So I post reels all the time. Uh, I... I even have other brands. I post other brands who are doing work um, in the circular economy or just in the waste reduction uh, industry. Just And so I know that's my outlet. Um, I'm getting into writing op-eds. So now I've been writing op-eds in, in the local news outlets. Uh, I think mm -hmm. we're in a space right now where you just have to be in people's faces. You can't, we can't wait for them to come to us. People aren't going to wake up one day and be like, I want to be climate conscious. Like, no, we right. knock on their door. Like, are you ready to be climate conscious today? No, <laughs> be back tomorrow. Like that, I think that's how, that's that's like the mode where we're in where you just have to, and then you have to make it fun. Like you, that's why like my cleanups do so well because we have a DJ and with my children's book now, I'm doing a kids only cleanup and I just got a 12 foot puppet donated to my nonprofit. So now I'm going to have like face painting and a puppet show and, and then, but, and then we're all here just to clean this part. So we're going to clean this part. We're going to talk about recycling and compost and everything. And the kids are going to be having fun and they don't even know they're going to be learning. So I think that's for me, that's like my style. Oh, Terrell, you make me like so happy. I, it's, it's, it's just, I, I said yesterday and I'll say it again. I think that the key to educating, I think that we're missing a hero. And honestly, that's what I saw with Terrell. Um, I, 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 I met, I, I first found out about Terrell because I was following hashtag sanitation worker. <laughs> on on Instagram I, that was one of my handles I was, or tags I was following and I saw him post over the COVID and I was like oh, I, this is what I've been waiting for like a sanitation worker who is like rising to fame just like just like you know um documenting a day in the life and the different piles and grading them I was like this is the most innovative creative use I have seen and and so, uh, yeah, I believe that what we're missing and what has not happened is the amplification and elevation of the sanitation worker as real right. heroes in the circular economy. And there's a reason for that. I mean, there's a reason that the big companies have not invested in their sanitation workers. I'll get my passion, my anger passion will come out now. <laughs> Um, you know, to elevate and amplify their voices. And I it's it's time to to really 
um, notice how that the sanitation workers and the people on the front line are positively impacting our communities and give them the space and the platform to share their voice, share their ideas and their creativity. And that's one thing I learned when I was um, overseeing collection contracts. I started riding the routes um, and uh, and it was really fun because it was just me and the driver. And I was like, ask them so many questions and yeah. they had so many answers and solutions that I had never heard at the management level. Um, and that really inspired me. So yeah, I think we have to, um, we have to figure out a way to, um, really make our hero here, the frontline workers. And, um, and I think yeah. that would be one to embrace that. Um, to your point, when I was, um, when I was working for the hauler at the beginning of my career, um, I, I always believe that, um, there is this, really unnecessary divide between sales and marketing and operations, right? I just feel like there's just this weird, you know, purposeful, <laughs> you know, division. Um, and I felt that there's no reason for that because we really do need each other, right? We can't, neither one of us can operate without the other. So um, I made it my business every month to go out on a truck you know, and ride, you know, with the drivers and get to know them. And they would bring me leads every day and they would stop by my desk and we would talk and they say, oh, you know, I was just over on this street and there's a new, you know, there's a new CarMax going up. You should go over there and talk to them about, you know, if they have, you know, I think I saw, you know, a 40 yarder out there. You might want to go out there and see like where that's from or like if they need another one. And they were, you know, we just had this great, rapport um you know and I can go into it you know there's 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 like all this documentation about how you know I came in and I broke all these records um in sales but it really was because I was partnered with the entire organization I didn't just go out there on my own and just do my own thing like I literally you know partnered with operations and said where you know where are we needed where do you see you know that there is the most um the most need where where do we have low density where can we fill in and those drivers would come and they would bring it back to me and I loved it and I would say okay we need you know what's going on in this property it looks like you know it's a mess all the time what's going on do you think we need to you know bring another bin out here is there something else that we can do and we would be it would be a partnership because I wanted their lives to be easier because when their lives were easier they made my life easier and I got a lot less complaints when my drivers were happy, <laughs> when my drivers went out there. The, the funny thing is like leadership makes all the decisions, does everything. And then when us, the frontline workers or the sanitation workers come back and be like, it's actually easier if we do it this. Like I have a prime example. Within like my first couple of months, the way the route was cut up just didn't work. So we would do it our way and still get done. But they thought that we were doing it their way. So one day the supervisor was following us and it was like, y'all made the wrong turn. It was like, no, it's actually easier to do it this way. For us tooth and nail to do it their way. And then when the route didn't get picked up, it was like, well, why didn't the route get picked up? Because we did it your way. And I was like, <laughs> right. that's a prime example of like, we're out here. Like you, like it's kind of like how I feel like where America is now. Yeah. People make decisions based on statistics and mm -hmm. then they refuse to include the people who are actually in it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm on the street walking 12 miles a day in this neighborhood. I know it like the back of my hand. It doesn't make sense to go down A Street before you do D Street because D Street turns into A Street. I could just make a whole mm -hmm. loop. And it's just like, and so I think like to your point, when when we were when we're allowed to voice our opinions or to adjust something that makes it better for us, it becomes a whole different ball game. And you yeah. like one of the things, like I'm still not like during the during the pandemic, uh, we didn't have PPE, we didn't have cleaning supplies, and that's how we were we were spreading COVID to each other in the truck. Wow. We still agreed to a truck. So I have asthma, my children have asthma, my whole family has asthma. So I, I made a t-shirt and I started selling t-shirts and that's kind of how I got famous. Wow. One day this 
um, this restaurant reached out, was like, hey, what you're doing for the yard, for the sanitation work is amazing. Can we drop off some food? I'm like, you got 500 burritos you could drop off? <laughs> they dropped off 500 burritos. Wow. When I'd say, I didn't have to lift a trash bag for a week. I had people doing my route for me. People like people was like, you okay? You need anything? You, I'm yeah. having, I'm having dinner on Friday. You want to come to that? I'm like, yo, that's <laughs> crazy. Like, so like, when you treat us right, you you get a whole different type of person. Yeah, yeah I, I think what's really interesting is after the webinar yesterday, I talked to uh, an owner of a of a hauling company. Um, who I really respect, and um, I shared with him that uh, about the missing hero, and I said, you know, remember when. COVID hit, I said, and, you know, the sanitation workers just were not getting the credit that they deserved for keeping, mm -hmm. um, keeping our streets clean, keeping that moving, that really a pivotal function of our society moving, especially when it was going from like so much waste in the commercial sector to the residential. And we had to like figure out how we were going to manage that. And uh, he's like, yeah, I know we didn't get any credit. And and I'm like, well, it's systemic though. I mean, it's because this industry has always operated under the dark of the night and wanted to be like, oh, don't look, don't see, we're going to just take your garbage away. Um, and that has resulted in that we do not get the credit that we deserve for keeping things running because it's like, don't look, we're going to take this away. That has to be, stop being the metric that we right. run by. It's It's got to be- something different. And so I think that if we, if we get out in front and into the light of day a little bit more that people can mm -hmm. see the impact that the sanitation workers have on us on our lives every day. And I, you know, I, I remember during COVID, um, I had t-shirts made for all of our guys that said hashtag essential on the back because I wanted people to see them and it, it was amazing. They would be in stores and people would stop them and say, thank you for your service because they, you know, they had on their trash logic shirt and it said hashtag essential in the back. So it just brought to mind, you know, to people, oh yeah, I didn't think about the people that are actually doing it. And you think about, you know, these guys that, you know, at least in our business, I mean, it's, all of the sanitation workers, but specifically in our business, these guys are digging through trash, sorting, right? They literally, and this is at the height of the pandemic, when we're seeing six times the amount of trash, you know, than that we've ever seen before. I mean, and they are out there, sometimes they were out till 10 o'clock at night, just trying to get caught up on routes. And, you know, just to see how hard they worked and how they stuck through it. And while people were able to work from home, they weren't able to work from home. Right. And hazardous pay. That's what I was angry about. I I wrote I wrote a letter to our governor. I'm like, no disrespect. You gave the person stocking shelves hazardous pay, but you didn't give sanitation workers hazardous pay. And I always joke around during the pandemic, everybody was coughing and sneezing into their COVID napkins and tissues. When you throw them in the trash, who's the first person to touch them after you throw them in the trash? The sanitation worker. And the virus was everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was it was a very, um, for us, it was very humbling. Obviously, we got busier during COVID because there was a lot more trash. Um, so we had more business during COVID, but it was such a, it was such a difficult time. And then in California, we had the wildfires during that time as well. Um, so a lot of our workers were impacted by that. I mean, there was just so much going on you know, at the same time and just not um, realizing, I think people not realizing that um, these guys were out there. I'm going to have Jocelyn put a picture up um, of our guys out there doing their work. Um, Jocelyn, can you, can you share that on the screen? It's so great because it's like I see another reason why we're all the we're why we're all connected, and I know that the treasurer mm -hmm. feels this way very strongly as well. We we've we've talked about how amplifying the sanitation worker um, is is will help in a circular economy setting, but it, it also helps you know just on a just for the children to see that this is a this is this is something that like you can be employed and you can participate in. Um, and it's hero level status in my mind. 
Yeah. So these are the guys actually moving bins to the compactor. Um, and then there was another one. Do you have the other one with them with the bags? So, yeah. So they're actually cleaning enclosures. I mean, these guys are like every day, you know, touching. Um, yeah. These are the guys out there when I gave them their bomber jackets, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. And see, Rachel. So I. I yeah. I started a uh, a hashtag called support sanitation and it got used so much that Instagram asked me to give it its own page. So if you look up hashtag support sanitation, it has a wow. new page, but it's by it's sanitation workers around the world. Like I was able to talk to a sanitation worker from Greece and they were going through the same thing we were going through. Yeah, everyone. I mean, it's, it was worldwide. I mean, it's a pandemic, right? Yeah. So it's everywhere. So what? um, go ahead, Rachel. No, I'm just to say, like, I, I, I just am a I'm. I, I have a hard time. The dominoes fall so quickly in my head sometimes. Like, where can this go? How yeah. can we? How can we work on this as well? I mean, it's all connected. Yeah. But yeah. it's all connected. So as we wrap this up today, thank you guys so much for being here. I want to. Um, allow you both to tell us what you're working on, what's next for you, where we can find you. Um, and then I will close us out, but please share with us. We'll start with Rachel, share with us about your work, what's next and where yeah, we can find so, you. Yeah, uh, so our consulting firm, Diversion Strategies, one thing that we're working on, um, really focused on now is um, building out a lobbying coalition, the Recycle Right Coalition, um, which we borrow the name from the Recycle Right TikTok Challenge. We think that there's an integration there. But this uh, coalition is focused on just what we were talking about, reforming policies to allow for swifter adoption of um, technology and modernization of the solid waste uh, management systems, all the way down to the local level to ensure that um, consumers have a choice and that they're well educated about their choices um, when it comes to solid waste and recycling. And um, really to kind of change some of those very archaic laws that were that were created, you know, decades and decades ago that just don't suit and serve the circular economy. And so that's what our consulting firm is working on. And then Wiser, you can find us at wiserwomen.org, W-I-S-R. Um, and we are focused on um, providing educational webinars for our members, as well as networking opportunities. Um, and we have a spring mentorship series coming up starting next week. Um, we will have on um, women who are far, far along in their career. They're going to share their stories about how they started their career, where it went, and then they're going to be available for 40 minutes for question and answer afterwards to give career advice, get career advice, ask them anything. Um, so that is what is coming up next. We'll have the first one on the 7th, then the 14th, and then the 21st. So definitely take a look at that. Um, and uh, we're hoping, we're we're hoping to get Senator Nancy Skinner. Um, she's trying to make her schedule work, but um, we're really excited about that. And then we're going to be also having a big networking event um, in Sacramento in August as well. And so um, Lanika will be reaching out about that. And uh yeah, so just continue to offer those educational um, opportunities and create opportunities for networking for women and um, and other people who are interested in diversity, equity, inclusion in the industry. Fantastic. Terrell? Yeah, so again, my Instagram, Twitter, everything social media is your fave trash man. So Y-A-F-A-V trash man. Um, I am currently raising money for my workshop. I'm trying to take my Before You Trash It workshop uh, around the country. So I have a link in my bio on Instagram and Twitter, uh, my Givelify. So I'm trying to raise 10 grand to be able to uh, do a tour of at least uh, four cities and take my 12-foot puppet and a Willabago around the country mm -hmm. and teach children what to do before they trash it. I have a children's book out. Um, that can be on my website, which is down right now because I'm redoing it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's next week it'll be back up. Your favetrashman.com. You got click on the I'm cool too tab and uh, purchase a, a children's book. And um, uh, I guess I uh, I just took a job with a state rep, so I now work. For oh, 
<laughs> I now work for the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Congrats. Thank you. And I'm going to be pushing my state rep to be very climate conscious in our district. Love it. So hopefully, uh, awesome. if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see a whole wave of some public sector stuff uh, around environmental justice. Awesome. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram um, under Nika in the city. That is where I share all of my sustainability tips and recycling tips. And you guys can kind of see me just running around different cities. I travel a lot. So you'll see me in Chicago. You'll see me in DC. You'll see me in cities in California. So follow me at Nika in the city. Um, I want to say in conclusion, today's session on waste reduction, sustainable, sustainable production, creating a circular economy has been a remarkable exchange of insights and ideas. I'm so grateful to Bianca Ma, Rachel Oster, and Terrell Hagler for sharing your expertise and your passion. Your contributions have really highlighted the importance of collaboration and individual actions in driving waste reduction and sustainable practices. So let us all carry these learnings forward. We talked a lot about education and let's work together to create a greener, more resilient future. Thank you all for being part of this meaningful discussion. I appreciate you all for being here. Have a great day. Thank you, we appreciate you. Yeah. Don't hang up yet. Don't hang up yet. Okay, fantastic. All right, we stopped the recording. How do you guys feel? You guys tired? No.